from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. At the National Book Festival in 2001, the final event of what was then a one-day festival was uh, a presentation by Scott Berg in the Madison Building about his extraordinary biography of Charles Lindbergh. Uh, Scott is back with us today, and it is a, both a pleasure and an honor to introduce him for the second time at this festival. I've known Scott for 35 years. He came to Miami, where I was then living in 1978, promoting his wonderful biography of Maxwell Perkins. I had just, uh, the year before, published a biography of Ring Lardner, who was one of Max Perkins' authors, and so Scott and I struck up a friendship that has persist persisted, although I must say at a great physical distance ever since. You know Scott as the author of Maxwell Perkins, as the author of Sam Goldwyn, as the author of Lindbergh, as the author of a wonderful memoir of Catherine Hepburn, and now of this fine, extraordinary biography of Woodrow Wilson, of which I will say only that Scott, almost alone among presidential biographers, understands that a president is a human being as well as a policymaker, and has, em has placed great emphasis on the, the personal and private life of a man whose personal and private life was extremely interesting and extremely important. Scott? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here this afternoon. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, it was a really wonderful introduction. It means all the more to me coming from the man I consider the greatest literary critic in this country. So you are lucky people living in this city, I might say. But thank you. Thank you. So enough about him. Um, let's, let's talk about me and, uh, and, and Woodrow Wilson. Uh, I, I will tell you this much on a personal level about me. Uh, I have been interested in Woodrow Wilson since I was 15 years old when I read a book about him and became so entranced. I really have been reading about him ever since and in fact went off to his alma mater, Princeton University, because in large measure because Woodrow Wilson had gone there. For the last 13 years, I have been writing this biography of Wilson. And I thought before I talked a little about Wilson, I should tell you two main principles that have guided me in the writing of the book, uh, which Jonathan has actually alluded to already. So let me give you two planks in my platform here. The first is, and I know I'm in the most contentious city in the world, so, so hold your tomatoes until the end and we'll, we'll see if I've proved my point. But I believe Woodrow Wilson was the most influential president of the 20th century. The second point I'd like to make is that I don't think there has been a more dramatic personal life that has unfolded in the White House than Woodrow Wilson's. And as Jonathan suggested, what I have tried very much to do in this book is to integrate those two things because I think they belong to each other. I think Woodrow Wilson's personal life, as indeed any president's personal life, to some extent must to, must, has to, and does inform his professional life. And of course, in the case of a president of the United States, his professional life pr profoundly affects the country and indeed the world. And I think Woodrow Wilson was the first president to affect the world so profoundly. So let me run by you a few superlatives. Since time is limited, since I've got a big book because I was dealing with a very big life, I only have time to give you some of Woodrow Wilson's greatest hits, I think. But I thought if I threw out a couple of superlatives, because I really like superlatives, uh, it might give you some, some greater sense of Woodrow Wilson, or at the very least, it will give you some takeaways here this afternoon. The first thing that you must remember, and again, this integrates personal life with what happened later professionally, is that Woodrow Wilson was the first Southerner elected president of the United States since the Civil War. Most people don't think of Woodrow Wilson as a Southerner, but he was indeed born in 1856 in Virginia. His very first memory, his father was a Southern, was a Presbyterian minister in Virginia, and then they moved in, into three more states of what became the Confederate States of America. 
But during that period, when the Wilsons were living in Augusta, Georgia, Thomas Woodrow Wilson, young Tommy, as Woodrow Wilson was known as a boy, his first memory when, was when he was almost four years old, and the election of 1860 had just taken place, and this little boy remembered hearing, Lincoln just got elected, there's going to be a war. And Wilson carried that with him all his life. He carried with him memories of the war as well. Uh, growing up in Augusta, he was spared actually seeing a lot of the day-to-day -day horrors of the war. But anybody who grew up in the South really experienced vast devastation. And Wilson grew up. Then after the Civil War, during Reconstruction, they moved to South Carolina. He saw literally charred cities. He really took this memory of devastation with him. This is going to have a deep effect later in Wilson's life, because Wilson is going to be called upon to decide whether this country would go into a great world war. And Wilson, of course, resisted that war for years and then finally jumped in. But the reason for the great resistance was he remembered these boyhood images. He remembered the devastation, that's the word he used over and over again, of what had happened to the South. As a result, and just parenthetically, it's just interesting to remember, I think, Woodrow Wilson is the only American president who ever grew up in a country that had lost a war. And that was, namely, the Confederate States. And so he carried all that emotional baggage, too. A lot of that really changed what the South was and who Southerners were. And Wilson said time and again during his life, there is one place in this country, in this world, that nobody needs to explain to me, and that is the South. It was another place. It was another country. And so Wilson's election, you see, was a great reintegration, if you will, of the country, of the South with the Union. Woodrow Wilson, here's another one for you, <clears throat> another superlative. Woodrow Wilson was the most educated president we have ever had. I hesitate to say he was the most intellectual. I'm not going to forget Thomas Jefferson standing here in Washington, D.C. But I will tell you, Woodrow Wilson attended what was then the College of New Jersey in Princeton. Uh, he graduated in 1879. His aspirations then, he had political dreams already. His great aspiration was to become, as you know, I discovered going through his papers, because he had once made a little business card, homemade business card, that said Thomas Woodrow Wilson, senator from Virginia. And that was the dream then. And the way to achieve that dream was to become a lawyer, because most presidents began their professional lives as lawyers. And also, as you notice, senator from Virginia, because Virginia had sent more men to the White House than anybody in history. So Wilson went to the University of Virginia Law School. And there he studied law. Really didn't like the study of it so much. But after a year or two, he moved down to Atlanta. He opened a law office. He was really a terrible lawyer. Uh, in his year or two down there, he um, obtained no clients. Uh, he, he loved spending the afternoons reading. Uh, he read a lot of history. He a, read a lot of what was actually becoming a new discipline in this country, and that was something called political science. So he read a lot about politics, government, economics, history, and how they all were melded into this new thing called political science. And after Wilson realized uh, he was not making a living as an attorney in Atlanta, uh, he decided he was going to go to graduate school. One very good thing came out of his Atlanta years, and that was he had one big piece of business as a lawyer. And that was something that his family had thrown to him. There was some piece of property that needed some contracts done, some legal work. And so Wilson went to Rome, Georgia, uh, where he was tying up these loose ends, and where he, a Presbyterian minister's son, met 
a woman named Ellen Lou Axon, who was a Presbyterian minister's daughter, and the two of them fell in love and had a real old-fashioned 19th century courtship, um, a little more extensive than most because Wilson, although he was desperate to marry her, realized he didn't have the resources to do it just yet. So they had an, an engagement that went on for several years, during which time they exchanged thousands of love letters. Now let me restate this. They exchanged thousands of love letters. I mean, this is one of the most romantic correspondences that has ever been put down on paper. I'm not forgetting the Adamses here. I'm not forgetting the Brownings. This is really, very occasionally, rather hot stuff, in fact. Um, and you sort of think, I mean, many of you out here can at least picture Woodrow Wilson, the grim, doer, Presbyterian minister's son, why the long face, Woodrow? Um, well, um, but the fact of the matter he is, he was this incredibly passionate, intensely emotional man. And all of this comes out in these letters. And again, this becomes very interesting, knowing that we are, now in retrospect, that we are going to get a president who is this emotional, who feels things this deeply, who is so unabashed that he can put any thought, any feeling down on paper. He knows how to articulate his inner self. This is quite rare among presidents, I think. So anyway, Wilson, uh, upon getting engaged, goes up to Johns Hopkins University where he becomes what will be the first president to have a PhD. Uh, he's, he studied political science, as, as I suggested. Uh, he, before he had even received the degree, realized that in order to marry uh, Ellen, he was going to have to ha make a living, and so he chose academia. He felt politics was an unfair uh, playing field. He felt he had no chance not having any money, not having family background, that he could never really get ahead even get a foothold in politics. And so he began to support his family by becoming a college professor, first at Bryn Mawr College, the very day they opened the school. He was in the first cohort of professors when Bryn Mawr College opened its doors to just women. Uh, he was not very happy there uh, teaching just women. Uh, even unhappier was Mrs. Wilson. They, they soon married. Um, for the obvious reason, I think. Um, uh, but also, she thought they were not quite worthy of her husband. And so a few years later, he got another gig, this time teaching uh, history and, and political science uh, at Wesleyan College in Middletown, Connecticut. And after another few years, he got the call he had secretly been hoping for if he wasn't going to have a political career. And that was a job offer from Princeton. And so Wilson returned to his alma mater, where he took the school by storm, rather as he had as an undergraduate. But this time, he became the most dynamic presence, not only on this campus, but in this small town, and increasingly in the state of New Jersey, as he increasingly becomes a public thinker, an intellectual, somebody who writes books and lectures. And he's traveling all around the country now. So he is becoming a rather famous thinker in the country. And that's quite something, because in 1902, he had proved himself so indispensable after 12 years on the Princeton campus that they made him president of the college. Now, this was, this was a real shock to this little campus, a quite beautiful campus, whose president, before Wilson, uh, described it as the greatest country club in all of America. And Wilson really wanted to change that image. And Wilson, almost overnight, began to reform what was then just being called Princeton University. And in introducing numerous educational reforms, Wilson not only changed education at Princeton, he really affected higher education in this country. And indeed, if you attended a college, or if you know somebody who went to a college, 
in which you majored in something, in which there was a sequence of courses within that major, in which you took some electives, in which you possibly had two lectures and a class each week, maybe had an honor code thrown in there. That's Woodrow Wilson. That is the Woodrow Wilson model. He combined those elements, some he created himself, and basically that began to spread across the country. Now, here's a new one for you. Woodrow Wilson became, or I should say, Woodrow Wilson had the most meteoric rise in American history. It's a big one, but I'm going to stand by it, and here's how. In 1910, Woodrow Wilson was the president of a small men's college in New Jersey. And, and by that, I mean it was a small men's college, not a, not a small men's college. Um, Although James Madison did go to Princeton, and I, 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 I should add, 1771. So it cuts both ways for him. But here is, here is the important thing. October of 1910, Woodrow Wilson is still the president of this school in the middle of New Jersey. Okay? It's a small college. Now, the, if you can believe this, New Jersey was the most corrupt state in the Union in 1910 which had the most corrupt political machine in the Union, the Democratic machine, I should add. And they thought, we need a puppet. We need the squeaky cleanest puppet in, in the state. Who can we get? Why don't we go to that, that squeaky clean professor, that president of Princeton? Let's go to Woodrow Wilson, see if he has political aspirations, little did they know. And yes, indeed, he agreed to run on behalf of the machine. What they didn't realize is the first thing Woodrow Wilson would do after getting elected in a landslide is kick out the machine. I mean, he literally, physically shut the doors, banned the machine from even showing up in the government buildings. And over the next 18 months, Woodrow Wilson introduced the most progressive agenda of any state in the Union and got it passed. And this was quite stunning because, oh my God, this college professor has very sharp political elbows. And it was quite something. And now, everybody in the country is turning to New Jersey. And they're thinking, who is this guy? And indeed, in 1912, William Jennings Bryan, having, having been the leader of the Democratic Party, having lost three national elections, the party was now in search of a new face a new image, who better than this very progressive, very erudite, very proper, squeaky clean governor of New Jersey. And so, remember, most meteoric rise in American history? October of 1910, Woodrow Wilson is president of a little college. November of 1912, Woodrow Wilson is elected president of the United States, the 28th president. Now, this is where the roller coaster ride really begins. Woodrow Wilson comes in within the first two years, and let's stretch it and let's call it his first term even. But within the first two years, Woodrow Wilson passed the most progressive agenda the country had ever seen, full stop. That's it. He immediately redid the economy of this country by lowering tariffs in a big way. This doesn't sound very sexy, I realize, today. But it was in favor of enhancing a graduated income tax, which he thought was a fairer way to go, which he thought was a way that would, again, level the playing field for most Americans. He then created, presented, got past something called the Federal Reserve System which to this day remains, of course, the bedrock of, of our economy. The eight-hour workday, workman's compensation, put the first Jew on the Supreme Court. Every week, every month, there was some new idea, or Wilson would say, some new ideal that was going to be passed, something that he was going to present. And this is the other almost magical thing that Wilson did in his first few years in his first term of office. And that is, he not only redefined the, the 
possibilities of a president, the, the executive powers that a president could have, he being a political scientist knowing the presidency was the least defined office in the Constitution, and therefore his thinking was the president can basically do anything he wants until somebody tells him he can't. And that somebody would be the Congress or the Supreme Court. So that's the first thing he did. He really went in now, not only with sharp elbows, but arms swinging. The second thing, though, and this may be the most important thing, and it has resonance to this week, and that is Wilson redefined the way the President of the United States interacted with the Congress. Wilson had this crazy belief that the executive branch and the legislative branch should cooperate. And I mean that quite literally. He, meaned the, he meant the two branches should cooperate the government. And that meant, he thought, that the White House, the presidency, must be personalized. It must be humanized. It meant that he should make appearances, not just in public, but in the Congress. And so Wilson did something extraordinary that even members of his own party resisted, and that was he just began showing up. He, he realized that a president had basically not set foot in the Congress since John Adams left in early 1801. Nobody, even you know, now we have this great institution every year of the State of the Union Address, where we have a big ceremony and all that. That did not exist for 112 years until Woodrow Wilson decided, I will come forth and I will present the State of the Union and what I foresee the State of the Union as being. And he did that every year such that it became a Washington institution, of course. But more than that, Wilson had this highly progressive agenda. He thought in order to pass it, in order to emphasize its importance, I want to say to the Congress how important it is, and I will do it by voting with my feet. And so Wilson, get this, Wilson called 25 joint sessions of Congress during his two terms. This is once every few months. Wilson would show up, give a speech, say this tariff uh, address is extremely important. We've got to get a tariff bill moved. This Federal Reserve System is extremely important. This labor bill, whatever it was, Wilson would show up and give a talk, and then he would leave. That would be fine. It was extraordinary. Then he did something even more extraordinary. Wilson would show up the next day, and he would sit in a little room in the Capitol, a room that has basically been unused since Woodrow Wilson, as it had been unused before Woodrow Wilson. The room has a very complicated name. It is called the President's Room. And it's an idea George Washington had for the building of a capital, and that there should be this small room, and it is possibly the most beautiful room in the capital. It's small, high ceiling, has a desk, a couple of settees, and a few comfortable chairs. And the purpose of this room was to have an auxiliary office in which the President of the United States could come whenever he wanted and just sit there to discuss the laws he wanted enacted. And Wilson did. He would come back sometimes four or five times a day, sit at the desk, grab senators when they walked off the Senate floor, sit them down, have discussions. He would run a little classroom sometimes, the professor never leaving him, you see this part of his personal life now influencing his professional life, and he got these things passed. And so we now had, you see, a new mode of governance. Now, he did keep us out of World War I for a couple of years. He famously ran on, you know, the war broke out in, in the summer of 1914. Uh, he kept us out until 1917. He ran for re-election in 1916, on the slogan, he kept us out of war, <clears throat> but rather famously, on April 2nd, 1917, Wilson gave a speech to a joint session of Congress. 
And here's what he said to them. There's one line in this one speech. It may be the most important foreign policy speech ever given. Our foreign policy to this day, to this week, to President Obama talking a week ago about our role in Syria or not our role in Syria, whether there should be a moral component to American foreign policy. All of this stuff, all these questions, is America the policeman of the world? That all goes back, as does indeed every major policy decision, certainly one involving an American incursion elsewhere in the world, all goes back to one line. The world must be made safe for democracy. That has been adhered to, it has been interpreted, it has been misinterpreted. Whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not, whether you love or hate Woodrow Wilson, doesn't matter. It has become the foundation of American foreign policy. As a result of that, the country underwent the greatest mobilization in history, at least to that date. And we, an isolationist country buffered by big oceans on each side, suddenly we're going to war. We, a country with an army the size of that of Portugal's, was now going to send two million men overseas. And I'm not talking about a little crossing of the Hellespont here. We're talking about the Atlantic Ocean. And indeed, America went to war. And as a result of that war, America emerged as the first great modern superpower. Indeed, a genuine military industrial complex for the first time. Wilson's main reason, there are all sorts of things, and there are chapters in the book on this. But Wilson's main reason, I believe, that he sent us into this war was that he believed we could be part of the peace, that we could even dictate the peace. And he came up with 14 points that would describe that peace. And the 14th of those points was the most crucial. It was the creation of something he called a League of Nations. This was an international parliament in which countries could gather together sit at the same table. It's almost like an Arthurian dream. And there at that table, they could diplomatically iron out differences before they exploded into wars. It was quixotic. It was idealistic. It was this very noble notion. But to Wilson, it was realpolitik. It was the real deal for him. There was no reason not to do this. There was no reason it couldn't happen. There was one reason, however, that it didn't, one primary reason. Even though Woodrow Wilson went over to Paris to negotiate the peace and was gone for six months, and now let me rephrase that. Woodrow Wilson was gone for six months. The President of the United States left from December in 1918 until July of 1919. He came home for one quick trip in between, and that's it. But he came home with a treaty that wasn't perfect. He knew its flaws, but he knew one thing above all. It incorporated this League of Nations. And he thought that would even be able to iron out any of the flaws in the treaty. Now, here's the hitch, he being a constitutional scholar. And as all of you know, no matter what the president wants to put in a treaty, that's fine, but the Senate has to ratify it. And he returned to an extremely hostile, increasingly Republican Senate, and they wanted no part of it. I found, doing my research, some papers that suggested uh, there were some secret, like, Republican covens meeting while Wilson was away. And they were determined not to accept anything that Wilson came home with. And indeed, that proved to be the case. I don't want to, to diminish a genuine belief that a lot had that this was not a good treaty, that it was not a good idea to have a League of Nations, because the League of Nations also had attached to it this notion of collective security, that if there was a violation against one nation, all of us would chip in and fight it. 
Well, that's something we still argue about to this day uh, whenever we mobilize. And so Wilson, realizing he was getting nowhere with the Senate, I think embarked on, well, the greatest political mission that any president has ever undergone. And again, it was quite quixotic because here was a president who decided he was going to take his cause. He was going to take this idea of a League of Nations and he was going to bring it to the people. He was going to try to circumvent the Senate and he launched on a 29 city tour around the country. This was really the first time a president toured the country, sold himself, but not for personal aggrandizement. This was somebody who sacrificed his life, literally, to sell the people on an idea. Or as Wilson just corrected me, on an ideal. That's what he believed in. That's what he wanted the country to buy into. As is rather famous now, and something I really track in great detail in the book, Wilson collapsed in the middle of that tour. They rushed him home. Days later, he suffered a stroke. And now begins, here's another superlative for you, what I call the greatest conspiracy in White House history. Because the second Mrs. Wilson, the first one having died after one year in office and truly breaking the president's heart, forcing it, I mean, he really suffered a, a major depression. Got out of bed to fight the war and win the peace and all that. But now, in 1919, late 19, oh yeah, 1919, the second Mrs. Wilson and a handful of doctors conspired to keep from the United States, to keep from the world, the fact that the President of the United States had suffered a stroke. And for the last year and a half of Woodrow Wilson's second term, virtually nobody saw the President of the United States. And indeed, Every document that entered the White House and needed presidential approval, every decision, every person who might be granted an audience had to pass through Mrs. Wilson, who had been a young, attractive widow here in town whose family ran a jewelry store. She had no political experience. She had very little education, in fact. but. Arguably, Edith Bowling Galt Wilson became the first female president of the United States. She was certainly acting at least as a chief of staff, but I would say it was a very fortified chief of staff status. Wilson left the White House with the exception of the, those assassinated. Wilson left the White House the lamest duck ever to leave office. And he then suffered really the most just painfully tragic final three years, becoming the only president to remain in Washington, D.C. after his White House years. There ends up being an almost magical, inspirational end to Woodrow Wilson's life, which is in his final years living up on S Street. Each afternoon, he would take a drive with his wife and the chauffeur, of course. And there'd be a handful of people out on S Street just to see him. More and more people would come to the house just to pay a kind of pilgrimage to this shrine. Sometimes there'd be 100 people, sometimes 200 people. On Veterans Day, there were 10,000 people. The next year, there were 20,000 people. People would come from all over the world now just to see the Woodrow Wilson House, which I urge you to visit at 2340 S Street, open most days of the week. Well, I want to leave a moment anyway for a question or two from you, but I will say this. We are not put into this world to sit still and know, said Woodrow Wilson. We are put in it to act. And he gave every ounce of his being to make that come true. And I say to you, I hope all of you will at least take a moment to sit still and perhaps know a little more about Woodrow Wilson, and then perhaps you'll help spread the word about him. Thank you very much.
Thank you, thank you. I think I've left time for a few questions. Uh, uh, there's a mic, uh, so you're first up, sir. Thank you for your presentation. You mentioned that Wilson's tour, if you would, to circumvent Congress to establish the League of Nations was quixotic. I want to ask you if his 14 points and the way he went around the 14 points was not equally quixotic, <laughs> knowing how Lloyd George and Clemenceau felt about it and their feeling and what they stated was give Wilson his 14th point, quote, the League of Nations, and we can get anything we want with the initial 13 points that Wilson basically sacrificed the 13 points in order to gain his 14th point. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a very valid question. I think, though, if you go through the points, point by point, you'll see he didn't sacrifice 13. And certainly the essence of the other 13 points are incorporated, or most of them are incorporated in the treaty. There are certainly a few that are not, and there are a few botches. There were a few last-minute compromises Wilson made. There's no question about it. Uh, was it quixotic? Yeah, I think in retrospect, perhaps. Uh, at the time, though, everything seemed quite believable. When Wilson went over there, I think he thought all this could be manageable. It has been asserted in recent years that perhaps Wilson was duped by Lloyd George and Clemenceau, that he really didn't know the extent of the lion's den he was walking into. I don't really believe that. You'll see in the book there are a lot of instances in which he's quite savvy. He's perfectly aware of what they're doing. Here was the big problem Wilson encountered in Paris. He went over there, and there sitting at the table were 24 other nations. Now, those two dozen nations, each of them had a very specific agenda to gain more territory and more treasure. Wilson then arrives, who didn't have those things. He was not there to build an empire. He was there with one supranational goal, and that goal was basically to get the league. And so, as a result of that, that, that may have been the most quixotic thing, and some may say, in retrospect, the dumbest thing, uh, that he really didn't go in with, with a bag that he said, throw stuff in here for the United States, and maybe we should have controlled more of the world that way. But Wilson just didn't operate that way and, and didn't conceive it that way. But I think in the end, and again, I really parsed the 14 points, you'll see the, at the very least the spirit of them, and I would say in nine out of the 14 points, the essence of them is, is really, I mean, the real facts of them are there. So you'll see. But it's a fair question. It's certainly a fair question, which will probably be debated forever. Sir. What do you think of the autobiography of Thomas Marshall, who was Wilson's vice president? Well, this is a fascinating question. <clears throat> uh, Thomas R. Marshall, um, who was from Indiana, uh, a, a great, great favorite son of Indiana, in fact. Um, well, just before I get that, his autobiography, well, let me answer the question about the autobiography. If you read his autobiography, Woodrow Wilson's name only appears a handful of times, which is kind of interesting for the vice president. Uh, at the same time, he was seldom even in the White House <laughs> during the Wilson years. And the rumor is, and I will, well, I will now dine out on a story I've dined out on because, and now I'm just bragging, I knew Alice Roosevelt Longworth um, for the last 10 years of her life, uh, and I used to go up to her, to her salon up on Massachusetts Avenue and have tea, or as she would say, pouring whiskey, something more important. And we, she loved having me over because I loved Woodrow Wilson, and she just loathed him. So she used to just ridicule me for two hours. Uh, you know, I was in my early 20s, and she was in her, I think, yeah, she was in her early 80s at that point. And I was just, I was just kind of this mouse in the cat's paws, you know. Uh, but uh, she said, she claimed, now I know this, she claimed it so assertively, I know it's not true, but, <laughs> but, it, but it's a great story, which is she claimed that when they finally did break it to the vice president, and I mean weeks later, that the president had suffered a stroke, that Vice President Marshall fainted. So true or not, it makes the point he was probably ill-equipped. And yet, and yet, 
This goes back to why I call it a conspiracy, because who is to say this man wouldn't have become Harry Truman? Who is to say the vice president might not have risen to something that nobody knew he could rise to? And this was a decision arbitrarily made by Mrs. Wilson and the doctors. And as a result, in large measure of all that, we now have a 25th Amendment to the Constitution which details presidential disability. Sir. Yes, uh, as you pointed out at the beginning, uh, Wilson was the first Southerner to become president since the Civil War. He's a product not only of the South, but the Deep South uh, during an era when the Klan is in its ascendancy. Uh, Redeemer politics is widespread across the South. So would you say a few words about how race and racism affected Wilson's thinking and behavior? I will say a few words, and I'm really glad you asked that, thank you, because this is, you know, it's not all pretty in this book, uh, and this is indeed the unprettiest, well, this and the Alien and Sedition Acts, I think, are the two unprettiest subjects in the book, which Wilson, this great progressive, was extremely regressive about. And it must not be forgot, Woodrow Wilson did introduce Jim Crow to this city. He did segregate the post office and the treasury department, which in essence sanctions segregation anywhere in the United States that any state or even a community deemed it important to do. Again, this goes back to the personal side. This is somebody who grew up in a deep southern society during the war, pre-war, and this is what he understood. All that being said, he was a racist. His writings, his thinking, no matter what period and what context, it is racist thought. That being said, I don't think he was a virulent racist, if we can have gradations of racism. I don't think he hated African Americans. Um, he really only had hatred for a few individuals in his life. His real feeling about segregation, I feel, and again, I lay it out for you to decide if you agree with this or not. I'll give you all the evidence pro and con for him. But he really did believe the country simply wasn't ready to integrate. And he said more than once, it will take a generation or two before this country can deal with that problem, which would put you somewhere in the mid-1950s which may be exactly you know, on Woodrow Wilson's calendar. That being said, did he slow the process because he segregated this city, because he segregated government offices? Probably a good bet. And I would say he simply didn't want the revolution that did occur in the 50s and 60s to occur on his watch. And I will throw in one more political point, and that is, and this, here we must end it, I am told, and it was at this point um, that, that Wilson realized to advance his very progressive new freedom, his agenda, he needed the complete backing of the Democratic Party, which included that vast block of one-third of the Senate and Congress, which were Southern Democrats. And he, he basically remained true to them, to the Southern cause, and he got his new freedom, which ultimately was passed on the back of the African American in this country. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.